Good morning. Good morning. My name is Todd, and I'm one of those people too that Larry was talking about. Uh, I'm also one of the pastors here, and I have the honor and privilege of getting to preach God's word this morning. And I just have to say, uh, during worship, I was praying. And uh, Richard reached up and he was praying for me. And my wife was praying for me. And I felt like I heard the Lord say, somebody's getting saved today. So, uh, that took a lot of pressure off me because he's already decided, right? So, you know, the Lord, I feel like this week as the Lord's been pouring into me what I felt like he was wanting me to pour out this morning, I felt at one point like my head was going to explode. Um, he had me in Genesis, Proverbs, Matthew, Luke, all the way to Revelation. And when I got when I got done typing out everything I thought that he had given me, uh, I read through it, kind of like just reading over my first draft, and it was over an hour, y'all. <laughs> and a wise man once told me, uh, if you can't say what you're trying to say in 30 minutes, you're trying to say too much. So, um, y'all can praise the Lord this morning. I took that advice, and I will not be preaching from my first draft. So, if you're looking for something else to praise Him about, there you go. Uh, but really, if, if I can impart to you guys just a fraction of what I feel like He gave me this week, then we'll, walk, we'll all walk out of here different than when we walked in. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 15 primarily this morning and uh, if y'all don't mind before we dive into the text uh, let's pray Lord I thank you for allowing me to stand on this stage and speak to your people from your word by the power of your spirit Lord you know as well as I do that nobody needs to hear what I've got to say. But oh Lord, we all long to hear what you have to say. So right now, I ask your Holy Spirit to take over. Your Spirit is the only Spirit that is able to move this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. Alright, so we're going to be uh, starting in, in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. It says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now I want to pause right there in the parable just for a second. Uh, I have never preached out of this passage but I have heard some really good sermons on it and today I hope to show you something that that maybe you've never noticed because up until this week when I read this story the spotlight in my mind was always on the product the younger of the two sons but I want us for a moment to focus 
on the older son for a moment. You know, there's two sons in this story. So let's pick up in verse 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. So I, I want to pause right there uh, again for just a moment. And I want to remind, a lot of you guys will remember this, some of you won't. But several years ago, uh, I was struggling with an offense that I had against somebody. And... I was, I was really just replaying the offense or in, in, my, in this case, what, the offenses over and over in my head. And I was having these thoughts like, you know, I can't believe they did that to me. I can't believe he said that about me. I can't believe he said that to me. And I, and I felt a voice inside of me say these four words as clear as a bell. It's not about you. And some of y'all might remember that because not long after that, I decided to preach a message called, It's Not About You. See how original I am? Um, and I just shared with y'all what the Lord shared with me uh, about it not being about me. And some of you guys realize uh, in that message that it wasn't about you either. And then not long after that, I'm ashamed to say I found myself in a similar place and I was really struggling once again with forgiving somebody. And the, the, those voices were, were replaying the, the event in my mind and I, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe they did that to me. Blah, blah, blah. And I, this time I heard five words bubble up inside. The five words were, it's still not about you. <laughs> and, and when I realized that and repented for thinking more highly of myself than I ought, the, the Holy Spirit empowered me to forgive that person. And so, just in case you weren't here or for everybody else that was here back then and, and just you've forgotten what the, the meat of that message was all about, uh, let me just give you a quick... Uh, Crash, crash course in, in what, I, what I talked about in both of those messages. Jesus said it is impossible that offenses would not come. Uh, his exact words were, it is impossible that no offenses should come. And on the surface, that sounds like Jesus is saying it's impossible not to be offended. But that's not what he said. He said it's impossible that no offenses should come. Uh, Stephen Furtick says it like this. The offense is the event, but being offended is a decision. Okay, so Jesus said the offenses will come, but we choose whether or not we're going to be offended. So when an offense comes our way, we are often presented with some evidence. And for me, sometimes it's, it's like voices in my head. If you're a guest, you're like, man, this preacher struggles a lot. He's hearing voices. But just stick with me. Um, Revelation 12 verse 10 refers to Satan as the accuser of the brethren. And uh, that means the accuser of the brothers and sisters in Christ. And for the record, I believe that Satan and his demons are real because that's what the Bible says. And there was a time in my life when if I would have heard a preacher talk about Satan, it would have made me real uncomfortable. And if you're feeling uncomfortable right now, I want to invite you to come see me after the message and we'll take authority over what's stirring you up. We don't give glory to the enemy here, but we don't ignore him either. Amen. We preach what God's Word says about him and that's what I hope to do today. 
Now, again, Revelation calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. And it says that Satan would accuse us to God day and night. And obviously, if he would accuse us to God, then it makes sense to me that Satan's minions would accuse us to one another. Right? Now, when an offense comes my way, it's sometimes difficult for me to discern where the thoughts or the voices in my head are coming from. I mean, let's be honest. We, we can't blame everything on the devil. Right? Sometimes uh, I'll, I'll hear this voice inside of me that says, when the offense comes, and, and, and that voice sounds something like this, who does he think he is? Y'all ever hear that voice? Or who does she think she is? Now that could just be my fleshly pride talking, right? Um, what about this one? Husbands, don't nod or anything, just stare. <laughs> um, do you ever hear a voice that says, she never respects me? <laughs> you know, that could be that could be our pride or our insecurity or the enemy or all of the above, right? But let's go back to the parable for a minute. And, I, and again, I want to encourage you to insert yourself here, not as the prodigal, but as the older son for a moment, okay? The older brother became angry, verse 28 says, and refused to go in. So we see there the offense came. And he chose to become angry, right? He chose to be offended. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now, obviously, the father in this parable is a picture of our heavenly father. And I just think that that is such a beautiful example of how our father loves us too much to leave us where we're at. You know, he could have been like, well, if he wants to be a little punk about it, I'm in here to celebrate. You know? But... He loved that son as much as he loved the other son. So he goes out and he pleads with him. But verse 29. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now it sounds to me like this guy has been having some conversations in his head. Um, a side note is for when, when I am hearing or saying or even just thinking the never and always statements, those are often red flags that indicate the offense has come and we're listening to the wrong voices. For example, in, in this this story we're reading here. He says, I've always been here working for you. I've never disobeyed your, your orders. I, you never even gave me a young goat. And you know, he said, I never disobeyed. How many parents we got in here? Y'all know that's a lie, right? So how many kids we got? Y'all, how many people got parents in here? Okay, so everybody knows that's a lie when he says, I never disobeyed. All right, and then he says, I never gave you, ne he says, you to his father, never even gave me a young goat. Now we know that's a lie because Jesus starts the parable in verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. But check this out. So he divided his property between them. Okay? It wasn't just the prodigal that got the property. He was the one that demanded it. The father divvied it up to both of them. And Jewish culture said that the oldest got a double portion. So not only has he believed a lie here when he says, you never even gave me a young goat, he gave him twice as much as he gave the other son. Right? So when we find ourselves being presented with all these types of accusations, we need to stop and ask, who told me that? Whose voice am I listening to? But look at the next thing the angry, offended brother says to his father. Verse 30. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. Now what's the difference between this statement right here and the never and always statements that he made that we just now talked about? What's the difference? The difference is this one is not a lie. It's a fact. 
Now sometimes I find myself in the middle of spiritual warfare and I don't even recognize it. I don't even realize what's going on. Because I won't knowingly believe a lie. Y'all know John Bevere says, the problem with deception is, it's deceiving. Okay, nobody willingly walks in deception. And I don't know anybody that willingly will believe a lie. So in my life, what the accuser does to me is, first, when the offense comes, he'll present to me a fact. Okay? And just like here, the fact is the younger son did squander the property on wild living. But the Bible doesn't call the enemy the false accuser of the brethren. He says he's the accuser of the brethren. Accuser just is somebody that claims that somebody has committed an offense. It can be true or it can be false. So sometimes I believe the Holy Spirit's trying to tell us you're listening to the wrong voice. But because what that wrong voice is telling us is a fact... We, we start nodding, right? We start nodding. I was in sales for many years. And I learned long ago, if you can get your customer nodding yes during your sales pitch, the odds that you're going to close that sale go up tremendously. Okay? And do I have any other salespeople in here that know what I'm talking about? So, if I'm the older brother here, and, and the facts are presented, and I start nodding my head, and the accuser can get me agreeing with him, whether I realize it or not. And then, because I'm already in agreement, when the lies are presented, I take the bait. Guys, I'm just telling you how it works on me sometimes. And I know if y'all are being honest, sometimes y'all take the bait too. Remember what our real enemy comes to do. He comes to steal kill and destroy right so all his little minions are just following his lead whose voice have you been listening to but listen to what the father tells the son in verse 31 my son the father said you are always with me and everything i have is yours but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. That's the voice that we need to be listening to. The voice of the enemy will always seek to divide and destroy. But our Heavenly Father always seeks to save and unite. So whose voice are you listening to? One voice brings death. The other voice brings life. If we can figure out who's talking, we can figure out who we're listening to. Come on. <laughs> Jesus' blood has been shed for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you're holding on to unforgiveness this morning, I... I want to ask you to think about that person for just a second. Or think about those people. If you're holding on to unforgiveness, I want you to picture them in your mind for just a second. Jesus didn't just die for your sins. He died for their sins too. And the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. So which voice are we listening to? When the offense comes, as Jesus said it would, and we choose to be offended, oftentimes it's because we're listening to the accuser of our brother and sister rather than the one who died for them. So when, when those offenses come, and we have to decide whose voice are we going to listen to. The Bible says that it's to one's glory to overlook an offense. So if we can truly overlook the offense, then glory. But Matthew 18, Jesus gives us some pretty clear instructions about if we can't overlook the offense, if we're the one that's offended, we're to go one-on-one -on -one to our brother or sister, right? Uh, so you pretty much, you got three options. I didn't write this down, so I hope you do the math right. Um, when the offense comes, you're either going to overlook the offense, 
You're going to go to your brother or sister one on one, one on one, or you're going to be disobedient. It's not rocket science. And then in Matthew 5, let's say you're the offender. Matthew 5, and, and listen, I'm from West Virginia, but Matthew 5 comes before Matthew 18. We're often real quick, if, we, if, we're, if we've offended somebody, well, if I've really offended them, I'll just wait till they come to me. But, but it says, Matthew 5, Jesus says, woe to you. And he's talking to the offender. So if we're, if we're the offender, he says, if you know your brother or sister has something against you, go to them. Notice, Jesus didn't say, if you have done something wrong. He says, if your brother or sister has something against you. So we have to ask ourselves, would we rather be right or would we rather be righteous? Jesus says, if you're at the altar offering your gift and you realize that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go and be reconciled. That's what Jesus said. And it's His voice that we need to be listening to. He's the ultimate example. And He didn't just say it. He showed it. Think about the cross for just a moment. Think about Jesus on that cross, bleeding out, struggling to breathe. And now this next part's just conjecture. But I can imagine the accuser was in his ear. I can imagine the accuser was saying things like, listen to these people that you created mocking you. You should have taken that offer I gave you in the desert, Jesus. All you had to do was bow down and worship me. You hear those same voices that shouted Hosanna now celebrating your suffering? How about this one? Where's your father at now? That's what I imagine the accuser was saying. But what did the truth Himself have to say. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I don't have to imagine that. The words are in red. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what our Savior said. That's the voice we need to be listening to. Can you hear His voice right now asking you to forgive that person? Or are the accusations from your adversary too loud? The older brother was angry and refused to go in and be reconciled with his brother. But the father goes out and pleads with him. And I strongly believe that the father's pleading with some of y'all right now. How you respond has a lot to do with how your story goes from here. I'm going to invite the band to come on up. And... While they're coming, I want to, uh, I'm going to start, I'm seeing a pattern in my messages. I'm going to start just titling this the confession time, okay? That's when some people woke up, he's getting ready to say something. Like, but I was in a, a rough spot not too long ago, emotionally, and I was just wore out. And spiritually speaking, I didn't even feel like I could hold my guard up anymore. And sometimes the accuser will accuse us to ourselves to make us doubt who the Father says we are. Have you ever just felt like no matter how hard you try, you just can't get anything right? That's kind of where I was. I felt like I was getting hit from every angle. And then to make matters worse, some of my best friends were upset with one another. And then in the process of trying to be a peacemaker, I seemingly made things much worse. And from my vantage point, not only did I not facilitate peace or reconciliation, but I inadvertently hurt my friends who were already hurting. And in the midst of all that, 
I had all kinds of thoughts running through my head. All kinds of voices. I heard, what kind of person are you? What kind of friend are you? And then I heard, what kind of pastor are you? And then the next thought, which came as loudly as any audible verse, voice I've ever heard. It said, you know, pastor, maybe you're just not cut out for all this. And because I was so worn out, and so beat down, I said, you're right. You're right. I'm not. And I, I'm telling y'all, I was ready to throw in the towel. I was just ready to quit. But then, I heard this gentle whisper inside of me. And that voice said, who told you that? And immediately, I knew that I had been listening to the accuser. Because the fact is, I'm not cut out to do what I do. But the truth is, my father who knit me in my mother's womb, he knew he was going to empower me to do what he created me to do. And some of y'all have been hearing the accuser tell you what you can't do. And telling you why you can't do it. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you're listening to the wrong voice. The truth is, in my weakness, He is strong. That's true in your life too. And I declare to you this morning that I am sick and tired of listening to the accuser's voice. Is anybody with me? That voice brings death. I want to ask you again this morning. Whose voice are you listening to? Maybe you're thinking right now, I, I really do. I, I really do need to forgive this person. But you, you're having these other thoughts too. You're hearing these other voices that say, mm, if you forgive them, they'll just do it again. Yeah. Or if you forgive them, you know that's like saying what they did is okay. Maybe you're here and, and you know you need to go to somebody and ask for forgiveness. But you're hearing these voices. You know, if you ask for forgiveness, it's saying that they're right and you're wrong. If you ask for forgiveness, then they'll think you're weak. And they will eventually use it against you. Listen to me. Those who are hearing those voices, ask yourself, who told me that? Whose voice am I going to listen to? Guys, I got some bad news. The spirit of offense is on the move. And he's here to do just what his daddy does. He's here to steal, kill, and destroy. But hallelujah, I got some really, really good news. Greater is he who is in us than he who's been coming against us. Satan is a defeated foe. The same power that conquered the grave lives inside of us. In this battle, we've already won. We can literally use what the enemy is trying to divide us with to unite us more so than ever before. There are so many things that we as Christians should be fighting against. We should be fighting against abortion. We should be fighting against human trafficking. We should be fighting against racism. We should be fighting against the principalities of darkness that's influencing all of the above. But many of us are not fighting against those things because we're too busy fighting against one another. God forgive us. Of all the one another commandments in the Bible, fight against one another is not one of them. So as we do every week, we're going to open up the altar. The team has one more worship song prepared for us. And I just want to ask you one more time, whose voice are you listening to? What's the Holy Spirit telling you to do right now? Someone asked me a long time ago, Todd, do the, face, do the voices ever stop? And for me, I had to answer honestly, no. 
For me, the voices have not yet stopped. But what that means is, I better be darn sure whose voice I'm listening to. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice and they follow me. And that's the only voice I want to be listening to. If you're here and you're not on either side of an offense, praise God. Praise the Lord. But listen, Jesus said it's impossible that they're not coming. But if you're here and you haven't offended anyone that you know of and you're not offended, then praise God. I invite you during this time to pray for your brothers and sisters that find themselves on one side or the other, whether they're the offender or the offendee. Please pray for us. Pray for our church. Pray against the one that's seeking to divide us. We've got a lot of work to do. I don't know how many people have driven by our church while I've been preaching that if they die right now, they're going to hell. we got work to do, y'all. It ain't about us. If you feel like you're here and you're in this battle and the lies have been speaking to you louder than the truth, I invite you to come forward and listen to your shepherd's voice this morning. Not my voice, his voice. Follow him. He's clearly laid it out what you need to do. And if you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the one who bled and died and rose again so that we could be forgiven and come up out of that mud muck and the mire that the enemy tries to hold us down in. If you've never said, I want to follow that man named Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Can y'all stand? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for who you are. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you for your spirit. And Lord, I thank you that we don't have to believe the voice of the accuser anymore. Because you said when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Lord, that's the truth that we want to walk in this morning. It is for freedom that you've set us free. Lord, forgive us for putting those chains of offense, for putting those chains of unforgiveness back on ourselves. Please, Lord, grab our face. Fix our eyes on you. Help us do in this moment what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.
your body and your blood you shed for me. This is how we fight my battles. With you, with you. This is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. attitude of prayer you know in the military we have this thing called the, uh, the code of conduct and what that tells us is during battle if we find ourselves surrounded if we have a means to fight we need to continue to fight if we, there's a rock near us then we need to continue to fight it's saying do not surrender do not surrender but the spiritual battle we're in, the sooner we can let go of anything in our hands, the better it is for us. But we don't have to fight. He's fighting for us. Mm. I had an encounter this morning with a friend of mine who has a friend that's on life support right now. I don't know his name, but I know my friend's name is Jonathan. And he's asked to pray, so... He asked for a miracle. So church, if you believe in miracles right now, I ask that you extend your hand forward. Let's pray for this man. He had a, he's, he had a, uh, an aneurysm in his stomach and his abdomen. And something that should have caused him to die when it first happened. But he got a torn tear in his aorta and it started to leak. And that leak has kept him alive. And God used a tear. To save somebody's life, he can use anything. So don't you dare for a second think that he can't use what's going on in your life. He will use it. Heavenly Father, we lift up this man. In your name, we lift his family up, Lord. God, I pray that your hand of healing, God, would be upon him, Lord. There's a stripe on your son's back that says he is healed. God, we believe today that you are the same, that you have always been. You are the God of miracles, and we believe you.